Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing endothelin, uh, endothelins and the heart. Okay, right. So, um, we were in the process of discussing heterotrimeric G proteins. So these endothelin receptors of the type A, well, of type A or the type Bs, okay, they are all coupled to GQ heterotrimeric G proteins. Now, basically, heterotrimeric G proteins are named after their alpha subunit. So if you are a GQ heterotrimeric G protein, it means that the alpha subunit you chose from the 16 available to you was the alpha Q subunit. Now, heterotrimeric G proteins, and in fact all G proteins, have two states, an on state and an off state. Okay, and in the on state, they are bound to GTP, guanosine triphosphate, and in the off state, they are bound to guanosine diphosphate, GDP. So at the moment, our heterotrimeric G protein is bound to GDP, specifically the alpha subunit is bound to GDP, and it's in the off state. Right, now, also, our endothelin receptor has not yet bound the endothelin, so it is also in the off state. Now, some G-protein coupled receptors, when they are in the off state, um, i.e. they haven't yet got their ligand bound to them, will actually be bound to the associated or the coupled uh, heterotrimeric G-protein. Others will not. Instead, it will be the case that the heterotrimeric G-protein is bound to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, this inner layer of phospholipids here. Okay, so it will be whizzing around on the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. In either case, the heterotrimeric uh, G protein will be nearby the G protein coupled receptor. And when endothelins bind to the endothelin receptor, so when endothelin 1 here comes along and binds to this endothelin receptor of either the type A or one of the type Bs, then that will activate this endothelin receptor, and the endothelin receptor will now become catalytically active. And what it's going to do is it's going to cut off the GDP, the guanosine diphosphate, and it's going to bind GTP to that alpha Q subunit instead. So here we now have GTP, guanosine triphosphate, bound to the alpha Q subunit here. So this is alpha Q bound with GTP. Okay, so let me circle the alpha Q subunit in blue to keep the colours consistent. Okay, and this complex of alpha Q bound to GTP is now known as an alpha Q GTP complex. Okay, and when the alpha Q subunit is bound to GTP, it no longer wants to associate with the beta and the gamma subunit, so they go off on their own little adventure over here. and are henceforth known as the beta-gamma subunit, rather than referring to them individually. So they remain bound to one another, basically. Okay, right. Now, what is the alpha-Q GTP subunit now going to do? This is the G protein in the on state now. Well, basically, it's going to go and activate another enzyme, which is in uh, the phospholipid bilayer. So let's draw some more membrane here. And basically, in the phospholipid by there, you have another enzyme which is known as phospholipase C. And it's specifically a phospholipase C of the beta type that is activated by the alpha Q GTP complex. So this is a phospholipase C enzyme. Phospholipase C, and it's specifically a phospholipase C of the beta uh, type. So phospholipase C beta, often abbreviated to PLC for phospholipase C, and then you put the beta afterwards. Now, this alpha Q GTP subunit is going to go off and it's going to activate this phospholipase C beta here. Now, what is this enzyme phospholipase C beta going to do? Well, basically, once it's been activated by the alpha Q GTP subunit, it's going to uh, break down a normal component of the phospholipid by there. Okay, so let's see what this normal component of the phospholipid by there, that phospholipase C of the beta type, is going to actually work on. Right, so, in order to understand this, what we need to do is talk about the normal structure of a well, the structure, sorry, of a normal phospholipid within the phospholipid bilayer. 
So if I zoom up the phospholipid bilayer here, so I make it a little bit bigger, let's have a look at the structures that make up the inner and outer leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. And these are normal phospholipids. Okay, so the structure of phospholipid can be drawn in cartoon like so. Okay, so these two sort of vertical lines here, those represent the hydrophobic tail tails of the um, phospholipid. And these basically are where uh, the long chain carboxylic acids or free fatty acids have been esterified to the first and second hydroxyl groups of the glycerol molecule. So these basically are fatty acids, or the proper chemist name for a fatty acid is a long chain carboxylic acid. So if you're being strictly correct, you call fatty acids long chain carboxylic acids. Okay, that's what a chemist would call them. And these are also what are known as the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids. Okay, so hydrophobic tails. Okay, and these uh, two long chain carboxylic acids, one each, uh, well, the, each of these orange lines represents a long chain carboxylic acid. They have both been esterified to the backbone molecule of the phospholipid, which I'm going to show in green. So this green horizontal line is the backbone structure of the phospholipid. This is a glycerol molecule, so this is glycerol. Okay, and again, glycerol is the biochemist name for this molecule. The chemist name for glycerol is propane 1, 2, 3, trial. And although propane 1, 2, 3, can I fit it in? No, trial is a long mouthful. It's useful because it shows you exactly what the molecule actually is, whereas glycerol doesn't give you any clues whatsoever. Okay, propane is a free carbon molecule, and then 1, 2, 3 triol means that we've got hydroxyl groups or alcohol groups coming off every single one of those carbons, and each carbon has a single alcohol group coming off it. Okay, so what we do is we take this glycerol molecule and we esterify fatty acids to the first and the second hydroxyl groups of that glycerol molecule. And to the third hydroxyl group, instead, we make a phosphate ester link between that hydroxyl group and a phosphate group. So here is a phosphate group and we attach it to the hydroxyl group of the glycerol molecule on the third... Uh, uh, on, the, on the third carbon of the glycerol molecule uh, via a phosphoester bond or a phosphate ester bond. Okay, right, so this entire structure now, the entire thing is now what is known as a phospholipid. Okay, so this is a phospholipid. Right, and I'm sorry about the light doing odd things on the camera screen. Okay, so this is a phospholipid. And the old name for a phospholipid, the old biochemist name for a phospholipid, is to call it a phosphatidate molecule. So phosphatidate is the old name for phospholipid. Right, now, you might be wondering why on earth is he telling me some old name that no one ever uses for a phospholipid. And it's true that no one will ever call a phospholipid a phosphatidate molecule. However, when we're talking about modified phospholipids, everyone uses the word phosphatidyl. Uh, well, phosphatidate, sorry. Okay, so, let's talk about these modified phospholipids that are normal residents of the phospholipid bilayer and which phospholipase C of the beta type is going to act on. But we'll do that in the next video.